pregnancy and breastfeeding with multiple sclerosis, a very complex and controversial topic. Today I will share with you a lecture I gave about this topic for a continuing medical education course. I do want to give a caveat that I strongly suggest that you talk to your own provider about these issues and to not take this as medical advice. Some of the strategies I discuss are quite uh, controversial and some physicians would disagree with them. And also your provider would have to know about your specific situation to give you meaningful advice. But anyway, I hope you find this useful and please post any questions in the comments below. Let's have some fun. safety issues. 
Also, there's increasing data that breastfeeding is good for both the infant and also maternal health. And so women are encouraged to breastfeed despite these safety risks. So how do we reconcile all of this? So one controversy has been addressed. Most women with MS can get pregnant, and we know that it does not affect the overall prognosis of the disease, whether or not women decide to have children. And most women are able to breastfeed, and we can work our way around the limitations. But there are new challenges. As I said, pregnancy does not really protect against rebound relapses. So what should we do for people who are on fingolimod or saponimod or natalizumab? And as I said, some of these rebounds can be very severe, and some MS medications are simply unsafe with pregnancy and breastfeeding. And if you look at pregnancy and MS, things have changed a little bit over time. On the top row, you can see the data from France, where the pregnancy relapses, relapses during pregnancy were relatively high, 27%. In Kaiser Permanente in the 2000s and 2010s, it's down to 8.4%. And previously, almost no women were taking disease-modifying therapies, but now a pretty significant number of our patients trying to get pregnant are actively taking disease-modifying therapy. Also, the percentage of women who are breastfeeding seems to be increasing a little bit over time. And if you look at the data from the original PRISM study in the early 90s, it's a little bit different from what we see now. So if you look at the top line, you can see that the number of relapses decreases dramatically, especially during the third trimester, but then there's a rebound. For the first three months after delivery, there's a significant increased risk of relapses, and then it goes back down to baseline. In our modern data in Kaiser Permanente, overall disease activity is lower, and during pregnancy, there's virtually no disease activity, and we didn't really see a rebound. We just saw sort of a return to disease activity. So maybe the postpartum relapses are a little bit less significant in the modern era. Now first I'll talk about treatment of relapses. Most doctors would feel comfortable giving steroids if needed for a relapse during pregnancy. The fetus is exposed to about one-tenth of the maternal dose, but the exposure registries look relatively favorable. There's a possibility of an association with low birth weight and a possible link to an increased risk of cleft palate based on only some registries. But a lot of doctors would pre feel pretty comfortable with steroids if needed, especially with a severe relapse. During breastfeeding, the infant dose is about 0.7% of the maternal dose. With intravenous methylprednisolone, or high-dose steroids, it's recommended to pump breast milk and discard during the entire length of treatment. So for instance, if you're taking methylprednisolone daily for three days, you would pump and discard all of the breast milk. For lower dose oral prednisone, it's advised to pump and dump once. So one feeding you would have to discard, or some people would say for four hours after taking the tablet. And uh, relapses during pregnancy can be treated with plasma exchange or immunoabsorption, although there are potential risks like electrolyte shifts, fluid shifts, and an increased risk of bleeding depending on what's going on with the pregnancy, so you should have some caution. What about the disease-modifying therapies? Glutiramer acetate copaxone is very safe. When we used to have the old pregnancy categories, it was pregnancy category B, and subclinicians would continue it even during pregnancy if needed. Beta interferons are also relatively safe. Based on the accidental pregnancy registries, there's no association with an increased risk of birth defects, Though some of those registries suggested a possible slight increased risk of spontaneous abortions or miscarriages. The oral agents are generally considered to be not safe. So with dimethylfumarate tecfidera, in animal studies there's an association with low birth weight and reduced ossification of the hind limbs in rats. Now in the human accidental registries, there's not a clear signal suggesting an increased risk of birth defects, but there are some isolated reports for instance, one case of pyloric stenosis, another case of transposition of the great vessels of the heart and patent ductus arteriosus. Fingolimod or gelenia is definitely teratogenic. It crosses the placenta, and based on accidental pregnancy registries, there's a 7.6% rate of fetal anomalies. Uh, Saponimod has been found to cause fetal harm in animal studies and should be avoided, though it has a little bit of a shorter half-life than gelenia, about 30 hours compared to seven days and teraflutamide of Agio is known to be teratogenic. Now, in theory, the larger monoclonal antibodies could be a little bit safer. It turns out that they don't cross the placenta right away, 
Active transport mechanisms move these antibodies through the placenta only starting in the second trimester. So if you were exposed shortly prior to getting pregnant, they should be safe, even though the product labels don't really say that. So alemtuzumab is lethal to the mouse embryo and lowers offspring lymphocytes. There's also a theoretical risk of passive transfer of antibodies to the fetus. So for example, a neonatal graves would be a theoretical risk. What about the B-cell depleters? Dr. Casey sort of brought up this point, I believe, where maybe this would be an option for women who want to become pregnant. So it turns out that during pregnancy, there are potential risks. So if, if particularly with late exposure, there's a risk of low B cells in the infant. But people have done uh, individual reports where people have tested the B cells of infants whose mothers received rituxan earlier, for instance, and they've had normal B cells or prior to pregnancy. So it looks to be relatively safe if exposure is either early in pregnancy or prior to pregnancy. Cladrobine is known to be teratogenic and should be avoided. What about the washout periods? So glutiramer acetate is safe. Beta interferons, because of the risk of miscarriages, some people would recommend a brief washout, two to four months. For fingolimod, it has a long half-life, so a two-month washout is recommended. For, for saponamide, only a 10-day washout is recommended. With teraflunamide, it's actually recommended not to attempt pregnancy until you actually test the blood levels and see that they're less than 0.02 micrograms per milliliter. And there's a way to accelerate a elimination of this drug by giving cholestyramine or activated charcoal because there's enterohepatic circulation. Dimethylfumarate has a very short half-life. Probably no washout is required. You could just stop the medication and start trying. With natalizumab, again, because it's a monoclonal antibody, in theory, it's relatively safe to have a relatively short washout period because even if there's some exposure, the antibody should not get across the placental barrier. With alemtuzumab, the same thing should apply, but because of other issues with immunosuppression and secondary autoimmune disease, it's actually recommended to wait four months. What about the B-cell depleters? Ocrevus, rituxan, soon to be opatumumab. It's a little bit less clear. If you look at the product labels of rituxan and ocrevus, they actually recommend 12 months. I believe for ocrevus, there's a slight difference between the European and US label. But a lot of that is based on research done in people treated for lymphoma or other autoimmune disease, people who are exposed to other potentially teratogenic agents. So just to give some examples, Ocrevus has a half-life of about four weeks. Rituxan has a half-life of about three weeks. And for anyone who cares, Opatumumab has a half-life of about two weeks. And so in theory, we could stop these medications a relatively short period prior to pregnancy and the antibodies would not cross the placental barrier during the first trimester. So myself and a lot of other people would actually recommend attempting pregnancy only four to six weeks after stopping these medications, which I think is a viable strategy. For cladrabine, there's actually a six month washout, and that's true for men as well. And actually, I should also mention that for teraflunamide abagio, you can actually get into rat semen, so it's advised for men with MS not to conceive on this medication. What about breastfeeding? Well, one thing I should mention is that breastfeeding may have some effect on the disease itself. The older studies didn't really show any effect of breastfeeding on the risk of relapses, but some more recent studies by Dr. Helwig in Germany and Dr. Langergold in Kaiser show that exclusive breastfeeding, in other words, if you only breastfeed and don't use formula at all, the only source of nutrition to the infant is breast milk. It has some unique effect on the hormonal profile, and it seems to be protective against postpartum relapses. So perhaps we were wrong to recommend that our patients stop breastfeeding and restart disease-modifying therapy, <coughs> at least if we're going to recommend an interferon or glutiron. Now, what about the individual agents and their safety in breast milk? So the chart is a little bit complicated, but on the left is the therapy, then the description of the therapy, then I have whether or not it's detectable in breast milk, and then transluminal transfer, which means does it get absorbed into the infant if it's in breast milk, and then the potential risks, and finally on the right side, whether or not you could use it in a breastfeeding woman. Now, glutiramer acetate and interferon beta generally aren't used during lactation, but probably they're pretty safe. 
because both of them don't really get into breast milk in appreciable quantities, and they're unlikely to have serious deleterious effects in the infant anyways. We don't really use them, but in theory you could, it would, it would likely be relatively safe. Unfortunately, the oral agents can't be safely used because they're all small molecules, they all do get into the breast milk and have potentially deleterious effects, so it's recommended not to use them, particularly terraflunamide. What about some of the infusible agents? Well, the monoclonal antibodies do get into breast milk a little bit, but only at a very low level, so you can see less than one part in 200 for natalizumab, Tysabri, and for the B-cell uh, depleters, only about one to 240 ratio. So a small amount of these substances do get into breast milk, but in theory, the proteolytic enzymes in the infant should degrade these and they shouldn't really get into the serum. And uh, the point I'll make is that people have done like, you know, have used this strategy in breastfeeding women, and it does seem to be relatively safe preliminarily. Obviously, this is a discussion that you have to have with people, and it's an individual decision, and it depends on, you know, your risk tolerance and what is going on with the MS. But people have actually given B cell depleters to breastfeeding women and actually tested the B cells in infants, and generally speaking, they have normal B cells, though there is potential risks. With alentuzumab, it's recommended not to use it in breastfeeding, and cladrophine is definitely contraindicated. Okay, we'll go over these cases later in the discussion panel just to save a little bit of time. What about neuromyelitis optica? Well, interestingly, the anti aquaporin 4 antibody itself may affect fertility. In animal models, it can cause placentitis, inflammation of the placenta, and fetal loss. And that infertility in humans has been reported with antioxidant for a related disease. NMO is also associated with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, which can also cause infertility, so that can be an effect too. One thing to note is that antioxidant for can get into the fetus by passive transfer, but there are no clinical effects. So there's no equivalent of like a neonatal myasthenia that we see with myasthenia gravis. Just like multiple sclerosis, it seems that women have a decreased risk during pregnancy and an increased risk after delivery. Although I saw a few case series on anti-mog related disease, and if we put those together, we have 40 pregnancies, and five of them actually had attack during pregnancy. So very preliminarily, perhaps for anti-mog related disease, pregnancy is not as protective. What about the medications that we use? Well, azathioprine or imuran is thought to be relatively safe, including for lactation, although it's recommended to pump and dump for four hours after the dose of imuran. Mycophenolate mofetil or Celsep is a known teratogen and is contraindicated. There's a six week washout period, and it's also recommended not to use it in breastfeeding. Methotrexate is also a known teratogen, and there's a six month washout period. What about some of the other agents? Well, with the B cell depleters, there is a risk of low B cells in the infants to give it weight. And so that's definitely a concern because infants for the first three months are already sort of naturally immunosuppressed. And that's when you're expecting your own natural antibodies to start moving up at six to nine weeks. So there are some reservations about that, although you could potentially give it shortly prior to pregnancy and during breastfeeding if needed. For tocilizumab, which is Actemra, there is a potential link to prematurity, and there's a three-month washout period, and it does get into the breast milk a little bit, just like other monoclonal antibodies. So probably it should not be used because there's no data. Actemra, which is Celeris, we actually have a lot of data on this substance from <coughs> other conditions like hemolytic uremic syndrome, nocturnal paroxysmal hemoglobinuria, HELP syndrome, and the accidental pregnancy registries are actually very favorable for these conditions, although low levels of the drug do get into umbilical blood and breast milk. So that is a potential option. For the newer agent, satralizumab, which is the IL-6 agent, inembolizumab, there's really no data on it. So just to kind of summarize everything, most women with MS don't necessarily need to alter their plans for pregnancy and breastfeeding. Perhaps we should think of, when our patients ask us so that they should get pregnant, we should think of it like ICU doctors thinking about intubation. If you want to do it, you should probably do it, although that's an individual decision. <coughs> Postpartum relapses, when they occur, aren't necessarily high-impact events. 
perhaps we should be more concerned with rebound of relapses in the modern era. And for women who require natalizumab, uh, fingolimod, saponimod, you could consider switching to another agent such as a B cell depleter prior to conception, although the exact washout period prior to attempting pregnancy is not that clear. And of course, we should not be giving terapunamide or cladropine to women who potentially could get pregnant. And you could consider using monoclonal antibodies during breastfeeding if the benefits outweigh the potential risks. Uh, so I want to thank Dr. Annette Langergold and Dr. Kirsten Helwig who provided a lot of the data of the research that was done at Kaiser. And some people from our research team are Britta, Margaret, Jessica, and Edwin. And I'd also like to thank everyone, all the patients and the family members who helped us uh, conduct this research and participate in the studies.